This morning we'd like to draw your attention to verse 8 of the first chapter of 1 Peter, where he declares concerning Jesus, whom having not seen, you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. It's amazing how much in love you can be with a person that you have never seen. In reality, it's foolish for man to base his love on a physical attraction. That kind of love is so shallow, it's only skin deep. There's an old Swedish proverb that says, good looks don't last, good cooking do. <laughs> but it would also be foolish to base your love upon the fact that she's a good cook. Because she may be a good looking good cook, but be a halion and miserable to live with. Love has to be based on something deeper than looks or the abilities. It's built on character. The love of the person themselves, because they are so kind, they're gracious, they're loving, they're understanding. And, and that's what a long-term relationship is based upon. The deepest and most enduring love is the love that's based upon just the person themselves. There's a scripture in Isaiah that suggests that when we first see Jesus, that there will be no beauty that will be attractive to us. Isaiah said, that his physical appearance may even be shocking. When we shall see him, he said, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Because Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. It could be that when we first see Jesus, he will still be bearing the marks of the suffering that he endured for us on the cross. After his resurrection, when Thomas was doubting, he said, I will not believe until I can see the scars in his hand and in his side. A week later, when Jesus appeared, he said to Thomas, okay, Thomas, look. See the place where the nails pierced my hands. Go ahead and feel my side. You see, he was still bearing the marks of his crucifixion. And it could be that when we first see Jesus, that he is still bearing those marks. The marks of the horrible beating that he took as they put a sack over his head and began to pummel his face, hitting him with canes until his face was so marred that you could not even recognize that he was a human being. It may be that he still has the stripes across his back so that there is no beauty that we would desire him. But I am certain that if that be the case, seeing those marks that he bore for me and because of my sin, though there may not be a physical attraction, the love that I have, is so deep and so rich, realizing that he bore all of that shame, all of that suffering 
in order that I might have my sins forgiven and that I might have fellowship with God, I'm sure that my love will only be deeper and enriched that much more as I see the marks that he bore for me. We love him not because he's handsome, but because he is so loving, so kind, so gracious, so merciful, so compassionate. It's interesting that John wrote, we love him because he first loved us. And the love that people gain for Jesus Christ is so deep that many people have gladly given their lives for him. Others have given up a fortune that they might follow him and serve him in some of the dark areas of the world. How can it be that a person can have such a deep love for someone they have never seen? As John said, we love him because of the fact that he first loved us. You see, our love for him is actually a response. A response to the fact that he has loved me so completely and so supremely, my heart responds to that kind of love. He loved me so much he laid down his life for my sins. And hearing and reading of his love for me, it prompts a responsive chord in my heart, and I in turn love him. We love him because he has given to us so much. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. He came to bring you true life, life in the spirit. John the Baptist said of him, he that believes on the son of God has everlasting life. And he that believes not the son of God shall not even see life. John, the apostle, just said basically, he that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. You talk about Christmas. That's what it's all about. It is celebrating the fact that God sent his son into the world to give to us the opportunity to know God and to have fellowship with God. He's come that you might have spiritual life and that more abundantly. If you do not have that spiritual life in Christ, you're not a whole person. You see, man basically is three parts, body, soul, and spirit. But the spirit has to be born by believing in Jesus Christ. Up until then, your spirit is dead. There is no real consciousness of God or awareness or uh, 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 and that kind of intimate awareness of, of God. Oh, there may be, well, yeah, there, there must be some power or whatever out there. I mean, but there isn't that intimate relationship with God until your spirit is born. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you've got to have another birth. You've got to be born of the Spirit if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. How can I be born again? He said, by believing in me. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what Christmas is all about. We are celebrating the fact that God gave his only begotten son. That by believing in him, we would not perish but we would have everlasting life. That we might have a spiritual birth and become a 
whole person, body, soul, and spirit. Man who has not had the born-again experience lives only on two levels. And at best, you're only two-thirds of a person. You live on the level of the body and the mind. Your mind is controlled by your body appetites. Living on the two levels, you are living on the animal plane. Because animals live on that body conscious plane. Man, without the spirit, seeks to relate himself to the animal kingdom. He says, we are only a highly evolved animal. And, and thus, he seeks to relate himself to the animal kingdom because he is living like an animal. But a man who has been born again, has had the spiritual birth, comes to the realization, I'm not an animal, nor am I related to the animal kingdom. I am related to God. Man has fallen from the image of God because of the death of the Spirit. But when the Spirit comes alive, you realize, I'm related to God, and I belong to Him. Peter said, not only do we love Him, but when we believe, we rejoice with a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. The word unspeakable is indescribable. You see, there is a weakness with human language. There are emotions and feelings that are so deep that they cannot be described in language. Man has not yet invented words that adequately describe those particular emotions. And this emotion of joy that one has when he comes into a relationship with God, realizes that God loves me. And you come into this relationship with God, there is a joy that is indescribable. Peter said, and it's full of glory. There is an old saying that there are certain things in life that are better felt than telt. That is, there are no words that can express them. They're beyond the capacity of language to express. We sing a chorus, you are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, beyond our comprehension. When Paul the Apostle was given a short tour to heaven, as he later wrote about that experience, he said, I really don't know if I was dead or alive, but I do know I was in heaven for a little while. And there I heard things that were so astounding, it would actually be a crime if I tried to describe them in human language. I'm sure that Paul's friends are saying, Paul, tell us all about it. You were in heaven? Wow, tell us about it, Paul. And he said, I can't. There are no words. It would be a crime to try and describe with words. You would so lessen what it actually was if you tried to use human language to describe it. And so there was never an endeavor by Paul to describe his heavenly experience. When the angel announced to the shepherds the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, the angel said unto them, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
great joy to all people. We sing, how great our joy. But the joy is to all people, so we sing, joy to the world. The Lord has come. What are the good tidings of great joy? There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Man so desperately needed a Savior. One who could save man from the bondage of sin, from the power of sin. It's amazing when you give your life over to the appetites of the flesh, how powerful a hold those things can get on you. How they can hold you into bondage. And even though you can observe their destructive force upon your life, you do not have the capacity to stop. You need a savior. And there is born, the angel said this day, the savior. Sin had separated man from God. Alienated from God, man's life was empty. We needed help. We needed a savior. Our sins had separated us from God, as the prophet Isaiah said. And as such, our lives were unfulfilled. You see, this spirit of man only is alive when you have a meaningful relationship with God. But Without it, somehow there is a consciousness, an awareness. It's not really, I, I suppose, it on the conscious level, but underneath there is an awareness that somehow life must be more than what I've yet experienced. As, as David said, as the heart panteth after the water brooks. So panteth my spirit after thee, O God. And there is this deep longing, an awareness that somehow life is not complete. We try to fill the void many times with emotional experiences. We sometimes try to fill the void with physical experiences. And we find tremendous excitement in the chase. I think this will do it. Yes, if I can only have, then. And so in the chase, in the pursuit, we find excitement because there seems to be a hope of promise that, yes, once I can attain, I will be satisfied. But once you've gained the goals, there's always that emptiness because it didn't do for you what you were hoping it would do. Because the need is deeper than just the emotional level, there is a deep need in every man for this relationship with God. And Jesus, the Savior, came to bring to you the possibility of a relationship with God by saving you from the power of sin, the thing that was keeping you from this fellowship with God. Man, by his best efforts, could not save himself. So he seemed doomed to eternal separation from God. But good tidings, which will bring great joy to all people. The Savior is born. 
His name is Jesus. The angel told Joseph, Mary is going to have a son, call his name Jesus, which is the Hebrew word Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. There is born the Savior, the promised Savior. He is also the Messiah. God's anointed one. And the word Messiah actually means anointed. The Greek word for anointed is Christos. And so the Christ. And when we speak of Christ, we're speaking of the fact that he is the promised one from God. For God promised that he would send a Messiah, an anointed one, into the world to save the people from their sins. In the Old Testament times, when they would appoint a high priest, they would take a horn full of oil and they would pour it over his head. And that was a symbol of the fact that this man was anointed by God to be the high priest to represent the people before God, to come before God representing the people. And he would be the anointed one. Also, when a king was placed over the people, he would be anointed by the prophet. They would again take the horn of oil and pour it over his head, and that was the symbol that he was anointed by God to rule over the people. So God promised that there would come into the world one that he would anoint. He would be God's anointed to be the high priest for the people. That is, to stand before God representing the people. And he would be God's chosen ruler over man. And thus, Throughout the centuries, the Jews have been looking for the Messiah, the promised anointed one of God, who would be their high priest and who would be God's anointed king. The angel is announcing to the shepherds, he's been born. There is born unto you this day in the city of David, the Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And of course, the Lord is kurios. It, it is the one who rules over you. And when a person surrenders his life and Jesus, the Messiah, becomes the Lord over his life, There is, first of all, a tremendous love that is created in our hearts for him. Though we have not seen him, yet we love him. And now, believing in him, we experience a joy that is indescribable and full of glory. And that's what Christmas is all about. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas time. This tremendous joy to all people. The joy over the fact that I don't have to be bound in the power and in the grip of sin any longer. He's come to deliver me and set me free. I don't have to grope in the darkness of this world any longer. He came as the light of the world to give me the light on my path that I might walk in his light. I don't have to live in the sorrow of the world any longer. 
in the tragedy of mankind. But I can live and experience a joy that is indescribable. It's full of glory. That's what Christmas is all about. And that's exactly what God wants you to experience this Christmas. The Savior, who is the Messiah, that he might be your Lord, so that you too can know joy inexpressible, full of glory.